Hi, I'm Kaylee Martinez with High Speed Media and I'm here with the one and only Daniel Graves from Aesthetic Perfection. I'm so excited today. If you don't know him, he is amazing. You could give a little intro for the people that don't know you. Uh, sure. Uh, my name is Daniel Graves. I'm the singer, songwriter, producer, manager, tour manager on this tour of Aesthetic Perfection, essentially just the jack of all trades when it comes to uh, this project. We're, uh, Small, independent, um, electronic, rock, metal, industrial band. Uh, I like to call my brand of music industrial pop. And I think that's basically the Cliff's Notes version of what and I do. And he's being humble. He has over 76,000 followers on social right now, 45,000 on YouTube. Definitely being humble. <laughs> um, so how did you come up with the idea of hosting the Battle of the Bands for this tour? Because it's an awesome way to promote smaller bands and give them a platform to speak and have everyone listen to their music. Yeah. Um, I, to be honest, I can't really take credit for the Battle of the Bands idea. It was actually... Um, uh, sort of seeded in my brain by the That Zebra Show, uh, or sorry, That Space Zebra Show, which is uh, a Twitch show uh, that my friend uh, Bobby Shabansky from Blackcraft uh, hosts and, and, and runs and all that kind of stuff, awesome. along with Josh Balls. And when they were launching there, uh, basically, initially it was a, a podcast, and then they moved that uh, into the realm of Twitch, and they have this idea of doing a battle of the bands. And what they would do is have all of the bands submit their music. They would watch it live on the stream. And then the bands would promote the stream by telling all of their friends and fans and family to come to the stream and vote for them. Awesome. And I was like, this is one of the most sort of brilliant marketing ideas ever because not only does it actually give a platform to new bands, you're actually doing something good for the music community that you're a part of, but you're also creating um, organic engagement, organic sort of uh, promotion for your tour platform show, whatever. Yeah, so exactly. so um, I, I thought that uh, I could basically tweak this idea and, and use it for my Battle of the Bands uh, competition to basically see who would open for us on every show of this uh, tour we're on. I think that's great. Yeah, marketing, everyone working together, it really helps because the metal community, everyone knows in it, we're such a tight knit yeah. thing and it's awesome that we all have each other's back in that. And I think it's great that you use that for this tour. Um, definitely, this is the biggest tour you've done in the last three years. What were you looking forward to the most and what were you, what cities do you like playing in? I mean, the diplomatic and true answer is that I think it doesn't really matter to me what city I'm in because, you know, you do this long, long enough, you sort of come to the realization that wherever you are, you're connecting with other people who love music. So it doesn't really matter if you're in Omaha or Denver or New York or Tokyo. It's, it's, it's just an honor and a privilege for me to be able to travel the world and, you know, share my music with people. There was another question in that. Um, yeah. What's your favorite venue so far? Um, you know, I, I, I have to say, I really like the Marquise Theater. Uh, I think there's, yeah. Denver for the win. It's 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 a really, really cool spot. Uh, we played uh, for the first time at a place in New York called Les Poisson Rouge, which is another beautiful venue. Um, you know, we sort of leveled up on this tour in terms of the, the clubs that we were playing in. And so it's, it's nice to be able to play in places that have, you know, proper backstages and bathrooms and showers <laughs> instead of just like a, a broom closet where they're like, all right, get changed. <laughs> and uh, if you need to go to the bathroom, here's a bottle. Like, <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Yeah, for sure. It's definitely nice to have your own little area. Yeah. How does a live show compare to being live online? I know you don't get the same interaction, but mm. do you put the same energy forth when you're performing online versus in person? I think... It's important that whatever it is that you do, you do it 100%, right? So um, I've always considered myself somebody who's more interested in creating than performing, which I think is a sort of a shock to a lot of people because they feel like, they feel like you know, every band or every, every sort of musician thrives off of performing on stage when the, the, the reality is there's, there's a couple of different kinds of musicians and I feel like everything that I do is in service to being able to continue creating, right? So For sure. I always think of live shows and live streaming and all these kinds of things. They're like all actions that I take, just like marketing, in service of being able to continue creating in the studio, which is really what sort of feeds my soul and my whole existence. So uh, basically I, I just do everything with 100% intention and you know everything that I can give because 
I just want to make sure that I can keep making music for the rest of my life. Yeah, that's awesome to hear that you feel the same energy even through the screen and mm -hmm. in person with your fans. Um, also, speaking of touring, in a recent post on social media, you expressed, and even in your live, expressed that you think touring is going to be dead in the next couple of years. And do you think that has to do with these live streaming concerts and people not wanting to go out to venues? I think this is... Um multifactorial you know uh, we're just coming out of a pandemic which is obviously not even technically over um, we are still sort of dealing with the, the residual effects of that uh, we're in a recession uh, we are sort of having to combat the fact that most people these days do not socialize in person anymore you know, yeah, especially sure. like pff, Gen Z, like <laughs> kids these days do not find their, 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 their social connections by going out to bars and clubs and, 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 and music events. Um, so our job as entertainers, as live performers, is to figure out how do we like weave ourselves into this new world. It's For not sure. easy, um, especially when you're like older like I am, you know, I turn 40 next year. So it's it's. It's a challenge to not remain relevant, but I feel as an artist, it is your sort of duty to understand how what it is that you want to say fits into the current moment. So it's not about like selling out or forcing yourself, you know, forcing a square peg into a round hole. It's just sort of understanding what you want to say and how you can say that to to. The, the world as it is. So there's a lot of challenges that we're facing. Um, I think live music is going to just continue to dwindle in popularity and we're gonna see more people focusing on legacy acts and festivals uh, because you know why is somebody gonna go see one band for $50 when they can go to a festival for $120 for like three or four days and see all the bands. Yeah, that's this, very true. And, and this, it seems more popular now. Like you see festivals almost every weekend. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because this has been a thing in Europe for years. And now we're starting to see the same thing in, in the States. In Europe, you know, just a few years ago, it's like you could not tour if you had played a festival that year. They'd be like, nobody's gonna go see your tour. That's interesting. Yeah, and I think that we're just gonna sort of see that mirrored uh, stateside. Yeah, I really hope not. I especially, I love live music and coming to shows and feeling that energy mm. from my favorite artists, you know what I mean? It's just, there's nothing like it. Also, in this digital era, what's the best part about being an independent artist, since you are completely independent? Yeah, I mean, I think now more than ever, get, even, forgetting all of the sort of hurdles that we have to overcome, because of course nothing is ever perfect, but I would so much rather be an artist right now in 2022 than 20, 30, 40 years ago. The reason being was there's no real gatekeepers anymore, right? Like you don't have the right. cigar chomping music executive deciding what it is that the kids are gonna be into. Right? This right. is just, you create something, you put it out to the world. Yes, the signal to noise ratio is enormous. There's a lot to break through. But I think that if you are able to sort of connect with the zeitgeist and make something that people do resonate with, that you will find your audience somehow. And uh, I think that is probably the, the best thing about being an artist right now because I don't need a label, I don't need a manager, I don't need anybody to sort of give me the okay to be an artist. Yeah, exactly. It gives you that freedom of art because art is freedom mm -hmm. in that matter. And like, I love that you push the beauty standards, you push the limit. Even now, it's so hard nowadays to be shocking because there's everything online. You have access to so much, but having your unique individuality, like having that freedom is everything. Yeah, 100%. How does it feel being able to connect to all of your fans through social media? Like I said, you do have a big following. I see you responding to comments. You have a Facebook group. Like you're really interactive. Do you feel connected to those fans even through the online platform? Yeah, 100%. Um, it, my sort of social media evolution is, is interesting because, you know, I came up in an in industry before social media. And it's interesting as a young artist, you have this ego and sort of entitlement that's like rattling around in your brain. You like believe that you're going to be the next big thing, that you're like owed all of these fans and all this kind of stuff. And you take 
all of your wins for granted. And I spent so many years taking all of that for granted. And <clears throat> I think a switch flipped in my brain maybe like 10 years ago and I was just like, why am I sitting around being angry about all the fans I don't have, or the fame I don't have, or the things that you know I wasn't given even though I was entitled to them? Okay. Why don't I just start nurturing the things that I do have? Why don't I be grateful for the people who do care about my music? And once I started, I, I always put it in this way, once I started like watering my plants at home, I realized that they would blossom and grow and it was right. great. And so not only did I feel this strange sense of uh, gratitude, I felt like instead of going online and feeling like angry all the time, I felt like good. And so this is sort of the, the place that I'm in now mentally where I just feel super grateful for everything. And, and I take the time to respond to people because they take the time to talk to me. That's know? awesome. Yeah, I love that about like just mm -hmm. being able to have an artist that will even reach out to their fans because there's some that have gotten so big that they don't even look at their fans. Yeah. They walk straight past them. They won't give autographs, anything. So the fact that you're still <clears throat> having that connection is awesome. But you know, you, you look at people like Taylor Swift or right. um, Ed Sheeran, they are not too big for their fans. Taylor, Swi Taylor Swift holds uh, exclusive listening parties for her biggest fans in her home, right? Like yeah. you, you can see that there is, obviously you get to a point where you can't respond to everybody, but when you take your time to make individuals feel special and important and appreciated, that goes a really, really long way. And I don't think that there's a, any glass ceiling for that. For sure, I agree. And uh, what advice would you recommend to younger artists or even the upcoming people you have on your tour to grow their following and even uh, capitalize on social media? Um, be grateful, be authentic, um, be kind, um, listen, don't lecture. Uh, you know, just appreciate the fact that people want to talk to you in the first place. And I think that if you just sort of keep that in mind, that your growth will come naturally. For sure, I agree. And then um, is there anything you would like to promote, shout out? I know you have a lot more tours coming out. Go ahead, shameless self-promotion. Uh, uh, yeah, I just uh, released the sort of compilation of the 12 songs in 12 months project that I undertook last year in 2021 as a CD. It's called uh, MMXXI, so 2021 in Roman numerals. Uh, that is available now on CD, cassette, and very soon on vinyl. Uh, awesome. We are out here on tour right now across North America uh, promoting that record, and then uh, we're going to Europe in eight weeks, nine weeks, nine weeks, and uh, yeah, and then we're just gonna do it all over again. So go to aesthetic-perfection.net. You can find links to all of my socials, all my tour dates, my stores, everything. I'm easy to find. <laughs> awesome, well thank you so much for this interview and I hope more people go and listen to Aesthetic Perfection and get to know them. Thank you so much guys. This has been Kaylee Martinez with High Speed Media.